Paul, if for some reason you run out of the uh, questions on the book of Isaiah, I've got 60 here. And I'll keep bringing 60 every week because <laughs> I've learned for a class of this size you need four times as many handouts yeah. as people that are here. <laughs> so they're here. And uh, thank you for uh, making up those copies of uh, those scripture passages on uh, God's mercy and death because I forgot to bring them. But I hear they're already here. And I'll bring some more uh, next week uh, in that case. And uh, yeah, you heard about the cold weather. My son's in North Carolina and he called me and says, Dad, it's nine degrees here. <laughs> and how did you ever handle it? I said, I just can't stand being outside at nine degrees. And uh, so I said, well, remember I told you that when I was in Canada, I played hockey when it was 15 below. But I said, what I didn't tell you was when it was 15 below, there was no bench. We played the entire time. You have to in order to stay warm enough uh, when it's that cold. And so they said, well, what did you do when you had? And I said, well, there was plenty of rinks. And so we would just make sure we would just, you know, all go to the different rinks. But nobody sat in the bench when it got that cold. What was hard for me was when I was on the optical telescope <coughs> and uh, we had to do an eight-hour run uh, <coughs> at 15 below. And that's hard because you're basically just standing around. And you get, you're looking at the eyepiece and you're trying to guide uh, this star to get the spectra just right for eight straight hours. That was hard to do. Uh, I don't know whether you tried that, uh, Jim. Basic, basically guiding it at 15 exactly below. <laughs> right. Freezing, I don't think. <laughs> you know, it's not just keeping the telescope entirely. You've got to make it over the... Right. So that, that was hard to do. Um, and so my son said, well, Dad, what's the coldest you've ever experienced? Says, well, the coldest was 45 below. And so what's that like? Well, it's kind of like what uh, Dave was sharing, uh, where you would spit, and your spit would be frozen solid when it hit the ground, and would actually shatter. <laughs> and so you spit, and you hear it, and you hear it shatter when it hits the ground. <laughs> my son's comment is, that, Dad, that's cool in both senses of the word. <laughs> <laughs> so... But when it gets that uh, cold, you have to wear special clothing. Uh, matter of fact, what I read is that when Siberia, in that one place where it got down to 89 below, a couple of people actually died trying to walk from the car to the front door of a farmhouse that was literally just a few hundred yards away because they didn't have the appropriate clothing. You actually have to, well, even at 45 below, you've got to wear a parka with a special kind of hood it's got kind of a tube, but you, you know, all you get to do is see what's directly in front of you. Why? The air has to warm before it gets to your nostrils. Otherwise, you wind up freezing the trachea in your lungs, which is why in Canada, uh, no one uh, can be made to work outside when it gets colder than minus 40. And so the telescope I was at, uh, something went wrong when it was 45 below. Guess who had to go outside and fix it? Because uh, no engineer or uh, mechanic would go outside, uh, so I'd have to go out and do it. And you say, well, what, what went wrong? Well, actually what would happen on the telescope, the grease would freeze. <laughs> and so the telescope would stop moving. And so I would go outside with a cold chisel and hammer away the frozen grease, and the telescope would work again. So, yeah, and you have to do that every few hours. So, anyway. Aren't you glad you live in Southern California? <laughs> the rest of the country is freezing, but we're doing great. In fact, yeah, I mean, didn't we have the coldest day of the year this morning? And it didn't, it didn't even see any frost. I mean, gee, what, what a bunch of wimps we are here. Okay, <laughs> let me dive into this. We're going to get you into the book of Isaiah today. <clears throat> I got a little, inter little introduction prepared for you. But several of you asked me a couple of weeks ago, could you please show us all the uh, photos that have been taken for shows both the moon and the earth? And you know, Tim, you were talking about how Viking was the first one to do it. Voyager. Voyager, pardon me, Voyager, right. This is the Voyager photo. That's it. And uh, shows the moon and the earth together. And uh, this one is probably, I think this is my favorite. This is one from the Chinese Space Agency and uh, shows you the Earth up there and uh, the moon to the bottom. Yeah, that's easier when you turn the lights out. And so uh, they went just past the moon and took that shot. And the one I showed you uh, last week was this one <coughs> with the 
Osiris um, bo uh, spacecraft that's on its way to mine, uh, to mine samples from an asteroid. Shows you the Earth and the Moon. And as I mentioned last week, they had to brighten up the image of the Moon quite a bit because uh, the albedo of the Moon is actually only about 8%. Only 8% of the light that hits the moon actually gets reflected away. So it's very dark uh, compared to the Earth. But they brighten it up so that you can see it. And as I mentioned last week, the actual distance between the Earth and the moon is 30 moon diameters. So yeah, it's a lot more farther apart than what you see in that shot there. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about a scientific discovery. I've got a blog article coming out on it. So if you're a follower of reasons.org, you will see this. Uh, but what's been happening of late is that um, you've got two groups of people, atheists and younger creationists, who actually agree on something. <coughs> they agree that the Big Bang model is wrong for completely different reasons. Uh, the young earthers don't like Big Bang cosmology because it makes the universe way too young. Atheists don't like it because it makes it, pardon me, way too old. Atheists don't like it because it makes it way too young. And so uh, the fact that it's 14 billion years uh, is a problem for both uh, certain atheists and younger creationists. And kind of the heart of this in the last year <coughs> is they've been saying, well, the Big Bang model only works. The Big Bang creation model only works if you've got about five or six times more dark matter than you do baronic matter. And you say, what's the difference? Uh, I used to refer to it as ordinary matter and exotic matter, but the terminologies change in the astronomical literature. So they call it baronic matter, which mostly people have no clue what that means, and then dark matter. Okay, baronic matter refers to all the matter that's made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So that includes everything we're used to, which is why they used to call it ordinary matter. So our sun's made up of that, the earth is made up of that, your body is made up of that. And uh, the dark matter, what they used to call exotic matter, uh, that's matter that's made up of particles that are different from protons, <laughs> neutrons, and electrons, and that they do not interact uh, very well with photons. That's the property of the matter we're used to. It strongly interacts with light. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of particles out there that don't interact with light at all, or they interact very weakly with light. So, for example, there are neutrinos, uh, which would be part of this uh, dark matter. They do not interact well with light. And because they don't interact well with light, you literally got trillions of neutrinos flowing through your body all the time, and it doesn't do you any harm at all, because they simply can't interact uh, with the photons. So it doesn't do you any damage. And incidentally, you have literally quintillions of neutrinos flowing through the Earth, and they never hit anything. Now, neutrinos are different, and they weakly interact with photons. <coughs> so every once in a while, you'll get an interaction, which is why they build these neutrino detectors 2,000 feet underground, uh, where they get to shield everything from cosmic radiation, and they just surround you know, huge vats of uh, fluid with uh, photometers, and they look for those rare instances where a neutrino will weakly interact with light, and they pick up the signal. Uh, so from that means, we've been able to determine that the sun is pouring out uh, huge quantities of neutrinos from its nuclear furnace. That's one reason why we can be confident that the sun is actually burning through nuclear fusion. We see the neutrinos. And the fusion reactor reaction is really the only possible source of those uh, neutrinos. I'll tell you what's interesting, though. The neutrinos we get from the sun's furnace, we get them within eight minutes after they're made inside <coughs> the solar furnace. It takes 100,000 years for the photons that are generated in the nuclear furnace to reach us here on Earth. And so what's really interesting is neutrinos tell us what's going on in the sun right now. The photons tell us what's going on in the sun 100,000 years ago, the center of the sun. Okay? So yeah, the photons from the surface of the sun get to us in eight and a quarter minutes. 
the photons that are generated in the furnace in the sun, which is the very center of the sun, takes 100,000 years to travel from the very center of the sun to get to the surface where they're emitted and get to us. But because the neutrinos inter don't interact well with photons, they just zip right through the sun. And uh, so we get them uh, literally within just eight minutes. Photons takes a long time. And that was how, uh, I thought it was way off the subject I was going to talk about, but that's how uh, astronomers know that we've been in an extremely stable luminosity phase uh, for the past 50,000 years. It's because of the neutrinos coming out of the sun allows to determine what the photon production was 100,000 years ago. And based on that, we know the sun has entered into an exceptional phase of its history. Uh, because for most of the sun's history, we didn't have this stability. We have it now. We discovered that uh, through neutrinos. But neutrinos are really the only exotic matter particles we found. And we know that it's not enough to save the Big Bang model. The <coughs> Big Bang model would be in real deep trouble if the only exotic matter or dark matter we knew about were neutrinos. But, you know, what Big Bang cosmologists have said, well, these other particles have got to be harder to detect than neutrinos. Look how hard it is to find a neutrino. These other particles are going to be even more difficult to find, and that's why we haven't found them, and the Big Bang model is not in trouble. But the skeptics have said this. All you got is indirect evidence for this matter. You don't have any direct evidence for this matter. Until a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Okay, but first of all, I want to share with you the indirect evidence is more than adequate to establish we have enough dark matter in the universe to fit the predictions of Big Bang cosmology. That's because whether it's ordinary matter uh, or exotic matter, it will exert a gravitational influence. And so neutrinos, uh, are, they have a very tiny mass, uh, but they behave just like every other massive particle. They're subject to the law of gravity. And you know, law of gravity, massive bodies attract one another. And so if you've got lots of this uh, dark matter out there, it's going to exert a gravitational influence. Now, the one I found, you know, I've been speaking about this with younger creationists. The one I found that to be uh, most effective in persuading people, yes, there really is about five and a quarter times more uh, dark matter than there is ordinary matter, is by looking at gravitational lenses. You say, what's a gravitational lens? Well, here's a photo of a gravitational lens. <coughs> We could turn the light off again. What you see here is a foreground galaxy. So there's a giant red galaxy in the foreground, and directly behind it is a blue galaxy. And because of the gravitational influence of this red galaxy, it has bent the light of the blue galaxy behind it and has formed what we call an Einstein ring. Because if you remember anything from your physics class, Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that a massive body will bend a beam of, beam of light that passes close to it. And so that's what's happened here, is that the light radiated by the blue galaxy has been bent uh, by the gravity of the uh, red galaxy here. But we can calculate the amount of ordinary matter in this red galaxy, just by looking at all the stars and the gas that's there. That tells us how much baronic matter is in this galaxy. <coughs> but it's not enough to explain this Einstein ring. In order to explain the dimensions of this uh, Einstein ring, we need a little more than five times as much matter as what we can actually see in the stars and the gas of this particular galaxy. However, people have said, well, that's an indirect method. But it is a persuasive method telling us there's got to be more mass uh, bending that light than what we can see in the protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so you kind of do the math. This is the total amount of mass. We subtract off the mass of baronic matter. 
the rest has got to be uh, this exotic matter which has a property that doesn't interact well with light. And you say, well, couldn't it be some other kind of matter? Well, wait a minute, we just figured it out. One kind of matter strongly interacts with light. The definition of this dark matter slash exotic matter, it does not interact strongly with light. And so all that uh, extra mass has got to be uh, this dark matter. Okay, that's one method. <coughs> Here's another method is to look at uh, a cluster of galaxies. This is in the news uh, just this past few days because NASA just released uh, this image and uh, this is not the highest resolution image. It actually reads one with, gee, uh, 7,000 by 3,000 uh, pixels. So if you wanna go online, you can see it. Uh, but of all the objects to see in here, uh, only two are stars. Uh, you can recognize the stars because they have these spiky patterns on it. Everything else is a galaxy. And so you just see just thousands of galaxies in this one. And this is actually a ga galaxy cluster. Oh, here's another star down here. Three stars, sorry. Uh, four stars. I see one over here too. <laughs> but everything else is a galaxy. And what's amazing is this is a cluster of galaxies seven billion light years away. And you know, as the universe gets older and older, uh, these galaxy clusters get bigger because they merge. But this ranks as the biggest galaxy cluster at that distance. Uh, literally, uh, <coughs> like 10,000 galaxy uh, members in it. But what is brand new <coughs> is that astronomers, even though this is, because we got powerful telescopes today, we can look at these individual galaxies and determine their motion. Uh, the spectra will tell you how fast uh, it's moving. And so they've done this with thousands of these galaxies. And by looking at the motions that they exert, because what's causing these galaxies to move relative to one another is gravity. And so again, it's similar to the gravitational lens. Uh, they look at the movements of these galaxies relative to one another, and they can determine uh, where the ordinary matter is, the baronic matter is, and then they realize there's got to be a whole lot more matter involved. And actually to give you the details of this, these are actually two giant galaxy clusters that are in a process of merging and becoming a super galaxy cluster. And so they actually can see two different concentrations. So what I'm gonna show you in the next slide is the same galaxy cluster uh, but with an overlay where based on the movements of the galaxies relative to one another, that blue stuff you see there shows you the position and the concentration. So the, the more intense the color, the greater the concentration. But everything blue here is the dark matter, the exotic matter component, not the ordinary matter component. So you can actually see how they determine, yes, it's two clusters coming together uh, because the exotic matter actually plays a much bigger role in this uh, than uh, the uh, baronic matter that we see here. And so this is one way we had reasons to believe and others have been saying the Big Bang model is not in trouble. Matter of fact, we see exactly the amount of exotic matter that the Big Bang model would predict. And it's an actually a great success of Big Bang cosmology that it has correctly predicted the existence of this exotic matter and has actually predicted the quantity and it's exactly what we see in gravitational lenses as well as in the velocity movements of, of these individual galaxies in the cluster. Yeah, Tim. Presume the uh, blue cloudiness is, is not an image but it's a series of calculations point by point for that mm -hmm. location. Yeah, it's a series of calculations. Basically, they looked at the velocities <laughs> of these galaxies relative to one another, figured out how much of it is due to baronic matter, the rest of it's gotta be due uh, to this exotic uh, dark matter. And then they wound up making a map as a result. Now, the brighter areas represent a higher concentration. The brighter areas mean you got more of the uh, exotic matter there. And this is how they were able to demonstrate, in fact it was the mapping of the exotic matter that was able to persuade astronomers these are two giant galaxy clusters that are in a process of merging uh, to one another. Because you can actually see two uh, 
In fact, if I were to go back one slide, it's rather challenging to look at the ordinary, because that's what you're seeing there. Here you're seeing the ordinary matter, the baronic matter. It's a bit challenging to look at that and say, wow, these are two galaxy clusters in the process of merging together. It's not that obvious. But when you look at this one, it becomes quite clear. Yeah, look at those concentrations. And yeah, this is clearly in the process of merging to become a big galaxy cluster. And incidentally, this provides an independent demonstration that the Big Bang creation model is correct because it is showing us as we look <coughs> farther back in time, farther away, hence farther back in time, the galaxy clusters are smaller and they're in the process of merging together to become bigger galaxy clusters. And so looking 7 billion light years away and 7 billion years back in the past, we're actually seeing uh, that that is uh, taking place. Yes? So what is exotic dark matter? Okay, exotic dark matter is matter made up of particles where the particles, unlike uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons, do not interact with photons. They either don't interact at all, or they interact at a very weak level, like the neutrinos do. And there was a time we thought neutrinos is the answer, but we know what the quantity of neutrinos are in the universe, and it's way too small to account for what we're seeing here. So they're not baronic, but what? <coughs> well, <coughs> besides neutrinos. Okay, the reason why you got critics of Big Bang cosmology is because the only exotic dark matter particles we've detected are neutrinos. And we know that's not enough to account for. And they're basically saying, because you've failed to detect these other particles, or you have no basis for being confident in Big Bang cosmology. And the pushback is this, well, given that they interact so weakly with uh, photons, they're not going to be detectable by the instrumentation we have <coughs> right now. Yeah. But this tells us that they must exist. And they've got speculations. I can tell you the most favored candidate for what they think is the dominant component of exotic dark matter would be axions. Uh, but there's a total of 38 different candidate particles that they've been able to develop just by looking at particle physics. And so theoreticians have been looking at the 56 fundamental particles we know exist and say, okay, <coughs> In order to make everything fit, what kind of exotic dark matter particles do we need? So they've talked about neutralinos, uh, they've talked about axions, sterile neutrinos. Uh, in um, one of my books, I think it's uh, The Creator and the Cosmos, I actually give you a list of all the speculative particles, but they're speculative. Uh, however, <coughs> Uh, astronomers are quite close to actually coming up with a positive detection of axions. And right now, it looks like axions probably are the dominant component, but they've not yet been detected in a way. Well, the one paper I've seen said we have a signal of axions where the signal is three and a half times above the noise, but that's not enough to win you the Nobel Prize. The minimum standard in astronomy and physics you can't claim a detection until the signal is more than five <coughs> times above the noise. We're not there yet. Okay. Yes, Gary. What model is <coughs> for these critics that give them a pushback to the Big Bang model? Okay, what they're saying is that general relativity does not explain the, all the dynamics of the universe. So if we were to go back to this thing here, they would say some other kind of physics explains that. It's not dark matter. And so they come up with things like a MON, which is called Modified Newtonian Dynamics. And I'm trying to say this is an alternative uh, to general relativity. Uh, and then they got other ways of uh, trying to make everything fit. Models or mathematics to support their models or MON models? Well, yeah, there's lots of papers published on this. In fact, that's a, a fairly uh, active field of publication right now, looking at general relativity and Big Bang cosmology and the alternatives. Uh, but what Big Bang cosmology and general relativity got going for, observations. These other things are speculations. Although there are papers published where they said, we think we can get a more accurate picture of the spiral structure of spiral galaxies looking at the dynamics of the distant spiral arms than you can with general relativity. 
uh, and I wrote a blog article on this oh, almost a year ago where I made the point they've now done more detailed observations that basically turn it the other way around. Yeah, you can make the MON model work uh, for those uh, distant spiral arms on big spiral galaxies, but actually general relativity gives you an even better uh, explanation. Standard Newtonian dynamics. They, they don't think, they hope they can come up with something else. They hope they can come up with something else. And the, the, my main critique of the modified Newtonian dynamics, yeah, they've been able to find one area <coughs> in astrophysics where they get just as good a fit as you would get with standard Newtonian dynamics and general relativity, but it's the only place. Everywhere else things are discordant. But they're saying, hey, we think we get a better fit here, and they're using that to kind of overturn uh, the whole paradigm. And keep in mind, a lot of this is theologically motivated. I mean, the Bible predicted Big Bang cosmology thousands of years ago. We're going to see that as we go into the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah says more about Big Bang cosmology than any other book ever written until the 20th century. And so and that explains why in the early part of the 20th century, astronomers who are not Christians were very opposed to the Big Bang, basically because they recognize that if they accept the Big Bang, it's basically saying the Bible got it right, the Christians got it right, uh, what the Bible says about the universe is correct. And they're saying, we can't have that. And the other thing was, it made the universe way too young in order to sustain biological evolution. The idea that life originated and evolved without any divine intervention. They said, hey, we're only talking billions of years. This isn't going to work. And that's why I said earlier, you've got two groups that don't like the Big Bang. One group doesn't like it because it makes the universe too young. Another group doesn't like it because it makes the universe too old. Uh, and they've been basically saying, and incidentally, it's not just dark matter. A lot of them have been going after dark energy, saying dark energy is wrong, dark matter is wrong. And on both cases, we've got this kind of indirect evidence that dark energy makes up nearly three quarters of the stuff of the universe. But we have yet <coughs> to determine exactly what's responsible for that dark energy. Cosmological constant, of Albert Einstein's the favorite explanation, but we don't yet have proof. There are other explanations out there. Same thing with the exotic matter, is that we got this strong indirect evidence, but we haven't yet detected the particles and measured the quantity of particles. As I said earlier, until a couple of weeks ago. It looks like we're getting close. And what happened is, yes? What kind of detector are astronomers using to get this axiom? Okay, as far as the axions go, <coughs> uh, it's based on the assumption that yes, although these exotic dark matter particles don't interact with light, they will decay. And there's speculations about the decay time, and so we don't know that, but for example, if you get an exotic dark matter decaying, it's possible in the decay process, it will interact with photons, in which case you get to see it. And so and that's kind of what's happening in the uh, discovery that was announced in Physical uh, Review uh, D uh, just literally uh, days ago. As I said, we think we're seeing the decay signal. So, however, uh, there again, uh, we don't have anything that's distinctive saying this is the particle, this is the decay rate. Uh, they're still working this out. But again, the bottom line is why be so skeptical when we realize just how extremely challenging these observations are? But I'll tell you where they made that publication of a signal noise ratio of three and a half. They were looking at a white dwarf binary star and looking at the rate at which it's cooling. And they said it's cooling too fast and therefore there's extra cooling. And they said we think the extra cooling is a result of axion decay. And therefore, they published a paper saying, we see excess cooling. And, um, but the signal noise ratio was just three and a half. But the reason why they, the paper got published, <coughs> even though they didn't have the demanded signal noise ratio, they basically said, all we looked at was one white dwarf binary. What if we look at hundreds of them? If we look at hundreds of them, we can drive the signal to noise ratio 
uh, uh, way up. And they're basically saying, announcing to the astronomical community, this is a worthwhile project to undertake. And it's only a matter of time until they do that. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's actually underway now. Nothing's been published since, but hey, the paper was just published a little less than a year ago, saying, hey, we think we're seeing the signal of axion decay in this white dwarf binary. Well, there's hundreds of white dwarf binaries out there. So if we simply devote the observing time to it, we'll be able to figure out whether this is really right or wrong. And you know, it was fun about the astronomers engaging this, saying the Large Hadron Collider people are trying to find axions uh, over there in Switzerland and France. We think we can do it <coughs> for 0.0001% of the money they're going to have to spend to do it at the Large Hadron Collider. Because <laughs> observing white dwarf binaries I mean, they're relatively bright objects. You don't need big telescopes. And so it simply requires a lot of astronomer observing time. Uh, but <laughs> astronomers aren't paid that well, so it's a lot cheaper than uh, what they're trying to do there. However, I'm all in favor, guys, of the particle physicists of the Large Hadron Collider, because their efforts at trying to detect axions are trying to measure very different properties of the axions than what the astronomers are going after uh, in uh, these uh, white dwarf binaries. So yeah, we need to do both. And that's, I think, what's so exciting today. For the first time in the history of humanity, particle physics and astrophysics is studying the same subject. Isn't that amazing? You got physicists who are looking at the smallest things we can ever conceive of, and you got physicists looking at the biggest things we can possibly conceive of, and they're studying the same subject. I mean, what an amazing time to be alive. Okay. Theory of everything. Well, theory of <laughs> some things. Okay, go ahead, Doug. Um, <coughs> forgive me, but from a layperson's <coughs> uh, viewpoint, I like to make a one-sentence comment, and I have a question. Um, it, it, it seems like what you're saying is that there is considerable bias in the scientific community where they want the universe to turn out to be static or eternal, right? There's some of that, yeah. and I want to make this clear. But it's pretty objective. No, it's a very tiny minority. Okay. The evidence for Big Bang cosmology is so overwhelming that you only got a handful of skeptics left. Okay, so that uh, was just because of how strong the observational evidence is. Okay, so that was my comment from a layperson's perspective. And just to go back a little bit, when you were showing um, the slide of the, the, the two um, galaxies combining, uh, if I heard uh, you and Tim correctly, um, the blue right there is not actually the light. It's actually like some kind of um, digital uh, manipulation just to show the dark uh, matter. Is that what yeah, said? it's basically astronomers so it saying. Have any light. No, there's yeah. no light. There's nothing blue coming out of that at all. Yeah. They just overlaid that and said this is actually a, a calculated map yeah. of the position and the quantity of the exotic matter. And to show it, right? Just, just to show people yeah. uh, where it is. So, but yeah, it doesn't actually emit any light at all. Okay, let me move on to the actual discovery. And it was looking at the Perseus cluster of galaxies. Now, the Perseus cluster is much closer than this one. So, uh, here's a slide of the Perseus uh, cluster of galaxies. This is basically just the central part of it. But what's interesting about this Perseus cluster of galaxies, maybe we could turn the light out again, is that the core of this cluster of galaxies uh, has uh, giant galaxies <coughs> that are highly active. <coughs> what I mean by highly active, this is the most active one right here. You can just see all kinds of stuff uh, going on there, is that there's these super giant black holes at the core. And every large galaxy has a big black hole at its core. But in this particular cluster of galaxies, we have black holes at the cores of the larger galaxies that are coming in at close to a billion times the mass of the sun. And to put it in comparison, the supermassive black hole that's at the center of our galaxy, it only has three million times the mass of our star the sun. So we're looking at much bigger black holes, and when you've got bigger black holes, their gravity is stronger, and they wind up sucking stuff into it. And what happens with a black hole when it's sucking ordinary matter towards it, it's basically converting that matter into energy. E equals mc squared. 
and where we see the greatest efficiency is right next to a black hole. When a black hole is basically tearing matter apart and drawing it inside and uh, causing it to move at a high velocity, uh, you actually get a conversion rate of uh, matter to energy that's a little bit above 10%. And to put that in context, the nuclear furnace at the core of our sun converts matter into energy at 0.07% efficiency. And hey, look how bright the sun is and it burns for you know, 9 billion years. But this is far more intense than that. And so what a team of astronomers did is they looked at these bigger galaxies in the Perseus cluster and they detected a particular uh, line of X-ray radiation, the 3.5 kilo electron volt uh, X-ray line. And they saw it consistently in the bigger galaxies. And they observed it with three different X-ray telescopes. Now these telescopes, of course, have to be outside of the Earth. And so they're orbiting the Earth uh, because our atmosphere literally blocks out all the X-rays. But we now have three big X-ray telescopes orbiting the Earth. And they observed these galaxies with all three because each of the three has a slightly different design, so it's sensitive to different parts of uh, the X-ray <coughs> emission from these galaxies. But the paper they published in Physical Review D basically makes the point, the only way we can explain the radiation that we're seeing at this three kilo electron volts uh, X-ray emission is if these galaxies, the uh, what they call the nucleus of the galaxy, where the black hole is converting stars and gas uh, into uh, pure energy. <clears throat> if that's happening in such a way uh, that you're getting uh, emission from exotic matter at a very weak level and it's being absorbed uh, by, in other words, what's happening is you've got this radiation being emitted uh, from the cores of these giant galaxies and the exotic matter is absorbing that radiation and re-emitting it at a different wavelength. They said every other explanation doesn't work. That the only explanation that's consistent with everything we see is if there's this absorption taking place by exotic matter and re-emission. Now this is the closest astronomers have gotten to making a direct detection of exotic matter. Based on the Perseus cluster, and the five astronomers that published this basically said, hey, this is probably the easiest place to do the work, but we can do it on other clusters of galaxies. We can do it on uh, galaxies that are closer to us. Basically, they're saying the test of this is any large active galaxy, and what they mean by an active galaxy is where there's a supergiant black hole uh, that is sucking ordinary matter into it, where you get this very efficient conversion of matter to energy, uh, they said, if what we're doing is on target, we're going to see the same impact in galaxies literally around the universe. And they said, we've got it started here. Uh, this is something that should be relatively straightforward to confirm. All you need is lots of telescope time. Uh, but they basically need telescope time on these three uh, orbiting, let's say it's a Chandra spacecraft, the Atomi spacecraft by the Japanese, and uh, the third one is by the British, uh, the Newton telescope. And so they're basically saying, uh, let's get more time on these telescopes and look at more of these giant active galaxies and uh, see if we can nail this down. And part of the motivation is this. If we can actually not only determine that there's absorption and re-emission, but measure exactly how much absorption and re-emission is going on, we might be able to nail down exactly what kind of exotic dark matter particle is responsible for this. And the paper they published has said, we don't have good enough data to establish that, but hey, let's get started. So, yes? Well, a couple of points. <clears throat> One thing, you say that the dark matter is absorbing the radiation, re-emitting it. Well, uh, you're talking about electromagnetic radiation, right? Yes. You told us a little bit earlier, the dark matter doesn't interact with that radiation. It now you're telling me that it both absorbs it and emits it. Okay. Some speculated exotic dark matter particles like sterile neutrinos 
don't interact with photons at all, which means the only way you're going to detect them is by the gravitational influence. Neutrinos, not the sterile kind, but the kind like the tau neutrino, it interacts with photons very weakly, which means you need a really expensive detector deep underground to have any hope, and you've got to wait years to get enough uh, detections to actually say, hey, we see what's going on. <coughs> And so what they're saying is we're finding that kind of exotic matter, the kind that interacts with radiation weakly, which is why they needed such a powerful source of photons to start with. And so that was kind of what they were doing. They're saying, let's look for that region of the universe where we see the most intense concentration of photon emission. Uh, because if there's exotic matter there that's interacting weakly with photons, it's going to be easier to see there than other places of the universe. So that's why they picked on these really big galaxies with these super giant black holes that are sucking in uh, ordinary matter, because they said, if it's weakly interacting, that's their best shot of finding it. And they basically announced in Physical Review D, we saw it. Okay, so that's, that, that's, that's the discovery. Oh, okay, and the, uh, <coughs> to back up a little bit, you talked about the Einstein ring. Yes. Uh, the light comes in, it's electromagnetic like radiation, and it's bent. Yes. It's bent. The force for bending it is the gravitation. Right. The gravity is what forces so, the bend. So, so those, that's essentially the graviton that's bending that light ray. That light ray or something. Yeah, but we're not going to detect the gravitons. Well, that, that's, <laughs> that, 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 uh, that's what I'm uh, trying to get at is, is uh, that become, so we, we, we have the bending of the Bending of the photon ray by the graviton, or by gravity, which we think is, I mean, our best, maybe only explanation is that the gravitational forces due to gravitons. Well, basically what's happening here is it doesn't matter what kind of mass is responsible for it, it will bend the light. Whether it's ordinary matter or exotic matter, it's going to bend the light the same way. Yes. All you need to know is the quantity of mass. And so that's what they basically did here. They looked at the degree of bending we see here in this uh, Einstein ring and said, we now know the total amount of matter that's responsible for bending this light, and we know that the ordinary matter is not enough to account for it. There's got to be this exotic matter, and it's got to be at least five times more abundant than the ordinary matter to explain this ring that we see. Now, this is one example. Astronomers now actually have almost a hundred different examples of uh, gravitational bending like this. And also, we've been be able to detect planets. In fact, one paper got published where they found a planet in the Andromeda galaxy by using gravitational lenses. Only in that case, what they're doing is they're actually using a star. The gravity of the star bends the light of a planet that's directly behind it. Uh, that only works if it's exactly in the line of sight. You can tell this wasn't exactly in the line of sight, but really close. If it's exactly in the line of sight, you would get a complete circle. And this is, this is the best Einstein ring yet uh, image, because you've got like 90% uh, of the uh, ring present. But if it's exactly behind, you would get 100%. You say, what happens if it's like uh, less than that? Well, there are times where they see what is called an Einstein cross, where you basically get one patch of light here, a patch of light here, one here, and one here. That's because it's not quite exactly in the line of sight. Or you might just get an arc, part of an arc. And so I'm showing you the best example, but we have dozens of other examples where you see part of the uh, Einstein ring rather than almost all of it like you do here. And notice you can actually determine what that blue galaxy looks like. Uh, we know that it might, must be a young galaxy because it's dominated by blue stars rather than the old red stars that you see in this galaxy. And you can see that, hey, it's a galaxy that must have really prominent spiral arms because you can actually see some of the structure here. So it's amazing just looking at the ring how much you can learn about the galaxy that's directly behind it, yes. <coughs> know that this absorption and re-emission that we're seeing comes from dark matter, from something direct, or is it just that we 
have eliminated all possible sources of baryonic matter as being that. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. What you see in the paper is that uh, they've eliminated any possible <coughs> ordinary matter explanation uh, for uh, this signal that they're seeing. Now, this isn't the first time they've seen it. They have seen an individual galaxy that made this paper prominent. They looked at this cluster, and every really big galaxy that's got a supergiant black hole, they saw the same signal. And not just with one telescope, they saw it in all three telescopes. And so this is why there's such uh, excitement about this paper. They're saying this really removes any doubt. They're actually seeing uh, the absorption of this um, electromagnetic radiation by exotic matter and its re-emission. So, and also it's basically saying we can do a whole lot more. So uh, this is going to, yeah, all we need is observing time. So, and that's part of what goes on in astronomy, by the way. Papers like this get published, but the bottom line, it's astronomers wanting more telescope time because after all, it's not easy to get telescope time uh, on one of these orbiting X-ray telescopes. They're expensive to run, and everybody's competing to get the time. But I think they're going to get the time because uh, this is a groundbreaking discovery. So uh, within a few years, like you're going to see a lot more confidence. But I'm predicting this should really tamper or temper uh, the objections to Big Bang cosmology from the few remaining skeptics. Except the young creationists. Well. <laughs> What's interesting is I've been engaging young Earth creationists, Tim. They said, hey, if you think this is really on target, show us the exotic dark matter. Now we can show them the exotic dark <coughs> matter. So, and what I've noticed is uh, that they are step by step uh, being persuaded. I mean, for example, uh, Danny Faulkner, who is a young Earth astronomer, uh, just published an article on the Answers in Genesis website saying, we got to stop denying exotic matter. It says it's real. And we've got to stop denying this dark energy. It's real. They're just wrong on the other things. But in that part, they've got it right. <laughs> I find it kind of humorous that Andy Graff calls himself the Bible answer man still. And he's a younger creationist. Well, I, I, I was actually on a show a few years ago. And what he told me is, uh, I'm old earth when it comes to the evidence. I'm young earth when it comes to my emotions. So. Uh -huh. Now, maybe he's changed his position since, but what he told me was, I was led to the Lord by young earth creationists. I've got a strong emotional commitment to them. I'm with them because <coughs> they're the ones that brought me to the Lord. But he says, Hugh, I know the physical evidence is on the side of an old earth creationist. And we haven't had a chance to talk about, well, what about the biblical evidence? And you know, just a tip, I found that whenever I'm addressing a young earth audience, I talk to them about the Bible. I don't talk to them about the science. Just take them through all the Bible texts and show them, hey, if you want to read all 66 books consistently, it can't be done from a young earth perspective. It's got to be done from the perspective of a day age uh, interpretation of the creation days. And incidentally, every young earth creationist scholar I've met admits that the word yom has distinct literal definitions, one of which includes a long period of time. Their whole point is, well, the plain reading of the text would be 24 hours. But hey, it was the plain reading of the text when I was 17 that persuaded me they had to be long periods of time. I mean, what got me the first time opening up the book of Genesis is there's no evening and morning for the seventh day. And uh, there would be if the seventh day was finished, but there isn't. There's no evening and morning. So the first six days are finished, but not the seventh day. And hey, if you keep reading into the Bible, remember 66 books? You'll run into Psalm 95, John 5, and Hebrews 4, which all tell us we're still in God's seventh day. And sometimes I share this when I give my personal story, is that uh, when I was 11 years of age, 10 and a half or 11, my parents were really worried that I was being obsessive about physics and astronomy. I mean, I guess as parents, you would be too if your son came home every week from the library with five books on astronomy and physics and nothing else. And so they said, you know, this, this is getting a bit obsessive. <coughs> so even though our family was really poor, they went out and bought this expensive thick book on evolutionary biology and basically said, hey, 
to my sisters and me, you read this book. My sisters didn't want to touch it, uh, but I read it. My parents didn't read it, but I read it. But I went to them and said, Mom, Dad, the numbers don't add up. They said, what do you mean? I said, look at all the speciation that this book talks about before humanity, but there's hardly any after humanity. And I said, how do you answer that? They said, we don't have an answer. Go talk to your science teachers. <laughs> I talked to my science teachers, and they said, we don't have an answer. Uh, go talk to those university professors that you're friends with. So I went to those uni uh, you've been University of British Columbia professors, and they said, we don't have any idea. <coughs> when I picked up this book and read Genesis 1, it answered for me the fossil record enigma. Here I was, reading the Bible seriously for the first time, starting on page one, looking at Genesis 1. God creates for six days. He stops creating on the seventh day. And I said, that answers the fossil record enigma. Something that bothered me since I was 11, now at age 17, I had an answer. That's why we don't see hardly any speciation today. God has stopped creating new species of life. But also there explains there is, speciation. there is speciation. One got published, literally uh, just I was reading it yesterday. Uh, I think it was in the journal Science, where they talked about how, yeah, it was finches in the Galapagos Island, two different species of finches. And uh, they met one another, and they began to breed. And so there was a hybrid. And then the hybrid species uh, weren't too happy with the other two members. And so they stopped reproducing uh, with the others. And they said, that's a new species. Well, it kind of reminds me what we do with dogs, right? Where you take two different breeds of dogs, cross them together, and you get a new breed of dog. Keep in mind, in the scientific literature, my colleague, Fuzzle Rana, uh, counted. 16 distinct different definitions of a speciation event. And so that's one example. I mean, the journal actually said, this is a proven speciation event. But they, and, but they did put in the title of the paper, hybridization species event. Yeah, microevolution. So, the, yeah, it's basically microevolution. <laughs> basically, they're saying we were able to see, under natural process, a hybrid species of finches form in the Galapagos <laughs> Island. Now, it could revert. That may not be a permanent species. It could revert. We'll see. But yeah, same thing with the, uh, you know, Darwin, when he went to the Galapagos Island, he observed those finches for five years. And what did he see? He saw that the beaks of some finches got longer over that five year period. Others got shorter. Some got wider. Some got narrower. And so he said, if we just project that over time, we're going to get really. Uh, distinct speciation events taking place. Okay, what has happened since Charles Darwin? We've had ecologists go back to the Galapagos Islands and what they have observed is following. Yes, the, the beaks of the finches change with respect to time, but they oscillate. They don't just keep getting bigger and bigger. They get bigger, then they get smaller. They get wider, then they get narrower. And it's all in response to the variation in the food supply on these different islands. And likewise, you see that they did a study on the islands off of British Columbia uh, where you've got daisies. And daisies are kind of like dandelions. Uh, they make these uh, little parachutes for the seeds. And they said, hey, we're finding new species of daisies in British Columbia. Well, again, it's an example of microevolution because what they discovered is when these little seeds fell on a small island, over time, the daisies there evolved where they were producing smaller parachutes than the daisy seeds that landed on the big islands. And you kind of figure that out. Hey, if it's got a big parachute, it's going to blow off into the ocean and won't reproduce. Ones with the small parachutes are going to stay in the island and they'll reproduce. So yeah, literally over the space of just 20 years, they saw what they claim a new speciation event. But again, depends upon your definition of what a new speciation event is. And keep in mind, even the definition of a genus uh, is pretty fuzzy in the biological literature. So, I mean, a friend of mine who's a, a fisheries expert up in Alaska said, you know, here we studied all this stuff, and I, we all were taught that a, gen a genus is very concretely defined. But he says, notice that the steelhead trout is now referred to as a salmon. They moved it from one genus to another genus. So 
So even at the genus level, uh, the definitions vary quite a bit. When I'm talking to scientifically literate people, and I use the word try, they hate that. They say that's not part of taxonomy. <coughs> it's not part of taxonomy. The taxonomy of the Bible is different. Yeah. And even in the Bible, uh, you've got some variation. So for example, in the Bible, where it talks about the word kind, the word min, in reference to birds, very narrow definition. So you'll find two passages, I think it's uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy, um, no, it's Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that refers to six different kinds of owls. So it's basically identifying six different owls as being distinct kinds. But then there's another passage where it talks about four different kinds of flying insects. There it's at the genus level, not the species level. So it's kind of making the indication that when God creates a kind, uh, he creates that kind with a lot more capacity uh, for variation through adaptation when it's an insect, as he does for, say, a bird. Uh, so even from a biblical perspective, uh, you've got to watch. And keep in mind, biology is complicated. It's not like astrophysics, where you're just dealing with ordinary matter and exotic matter <laughs> and gravity. I mean, <laughs> you know, what's wonderful about the discipline I'm in Everything obeys the differential equations. So Hugh, speaking of, speaking of matter, it's time to end. It's time to did, wrap up did, this matter. I, I did hear two scientists this last week discovering that they discovered yet another kind of matter. It interacts with nothing in the universe, and it has no effect on the universe, and they can't find any purpose or any reason for it, and they decided to rename it to name it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> with that, you can close, you can close in prayer. <laughs> Yeah, I heard that joke 40 years ago, so. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, you, yes. Galaxy far, far away? <laughs> well, I got another story about galaxies far, far away. In fact, I wrote a blog article just a couple of weeks ago about uh, how different the Andromeda galaxy is from a Milky Way galaxy. And we refer to the Andromeda galaxy as our sister galaxy, but in fact, its characteristics utterly rule out the possibility that advanced life could exist there. There is no galaxy far, far away. And so I closed off my article for all the fans of Star Wars. May the farce be with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I think, is time to close in prayer. Right before we go down any further. <laughs> this is running downhill fast. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, we ask that you bless our time in the book of Isaiah. I pray you give us time this week uh, to actually get through this uh, text and Lord, I pray, too, that uh, you'd show us how we can rapidly uh, pull uh, content out of the book of Isaiah. And Lord, uh, may we be blessed by what we read and study. Thank you for the privilege of being alive in the 21st century. We live at a time when uh, we got scientists studying the realm of the extremely small and the extremely large, and they're actually working on the same problems. Lord, you are a God that is consistently created. Everything is harmonious. It all testifies of you. The heavens declare not only your glory, they declare your righteousness in designing it all to make it possible <coughs> that we could be redeemed into an eternal relationship with you. Help us to spread that good news as we engage people throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.